running a special delivery service in this war. We deliver ammunition to the customer. You make it, we deliver it. Deliver it quickly, accurately, and with the latest type of weapons. We deliver to large and small enemy towns, right to the doorsteps, if there are any left. We also deliver by air. Packages of demolition bombs, incendiaries, blockbusters. In the last three and a half years, we've spread out east and west, north and south. We couldn't have done it without you. Without the quantity and quality of your line of goods. On behalf of our fighting men on the ground, on the sea, and in the air, we thank you, all of you. The shell makers, the shell loaders, the workers who make the all-important bombs for our planes, and the men and women of American labor who produce the powder, smokeless powder, rocket powder, and all the other necessary explosives. Thanks, Miss Marlin. Oh, hello. You're doing a swell job. Aren't you uh, at all afraid of the stuff you're making? Why should I be? I'm an excellent insurance risk. Who told you? The National Safety Council. You know, they say there's less than half the number of accidents in powder plants than there are in all the other war industries. Well, how about my getting a job here? You're welcome. We're very short of men. And so are we. Hello, Mr. Tompkin. What's your job? Working with a cow. A cow? In a shell loading plant? <laughs> yes, sir. It looks like a milking machine for a 24-tit cow. But it really loads shells. Oh, I see. For a moment, I thought we got you on the wrong program. What program? Oh, hello, Mr. Becker. Aren't you the man who won a $50 war bond for turning out a record number of shell cases? That's right. Congratulations. You and Mr. Tompkin and Miss Marlin have been selected to represent the ammunition industry on our quiz program. I want to be in this, too. Hello, Grandma. Never mind that Grandma stuff. I'm making bomb fuses, and I should think that bombs are part of the ammunition industry. Quite right, Mrs. Bryce. And more essential parts than ever now. You're welcome to join our program. Well, what do we have to do? Ask questions about shells and bombs. You mean general questions? I know what he means. There are lots of questions I've wanted to ask, but never got around to it. Well, here's your chance now. Mr. Becker, would you like to be the first? OK. I'll tell you one thing I've always wanted to know. Is it true that a soldier in the field can tell from the sound of a shell overhead whether it's ours or not? More than that. He can tell the size of the gun that fired it where and how far away it is, what kind of a shell is coming over, and it's likely to hit him. I always thought you couldn't tell what hit you. That's true for a rifle bullet, because it has twice the speed of sound. You only hear it when it misses. So that one missed, eh? Yes. But with a shell, it's different. You can hear it coming. Do you want to get a taste of that? Well, I don't want to get hit. You won't. that? An 81 millimeter mortar. It fires the shell in a steep curve. That's why you can hear the sound over quite a period of time. These are all mortars, light and heavy. Man killers, we call them. And that's what they are. A mortar barrage is the cheapest and most efficient way to stop an enemy. We need mortars to cover our advance, to screen river crossings, to silence machine guns, and to stop counterattacks. Was 
that a mortar shell? No, that was a 75. You see, there's quite a bit of difference. These and the 105s are our best medium artillery weapons. Was that a 105 millimeter gun? No, that was a 155 howitzer. What's the difference between a gun and a howitzer? Well, here's a 155 gun and howitzer. That's the howitzer on the right. Now I ask you, what is the difference? Well, howitzer's smaller. Smaller and lighter, and therefore can be moved easier. A howitzer could be called an overgrown mortar. It fires a shell at a higher angle of elevation over a shorter range than the same size gun. It's like the difference between a line drive and a high fly in a ball game. By the way, the 155 gun on the left is also known as Long Tom. How far can you fire with a Long Tom? Approximately 12 miles. Here's a range table for all kinds of weapons. Rifles, mortars, guns and howitzers. Look at the curves of the shells and listen to them. A Garand rifle. A heavy machine gun. Just for comparison, here's what a Japanese machine gun sounds like. Now, a heavy American mortar. A 75 gun. A 105 howitzer. A 155 howitzer. A long tom. And the giant 240 howitzer. And when they all get together, they sound like this. Does that answer your question, Mr. Becker? Yes, sir. It certainly does. What about rockets? Now, once you've heard the sound of a rocket, you'll never forget it. And neither can the enemy. If rockets are so destructive, why do we keep on using heavy guns? Because long-range rocket fire isn't as accurate as gunfire. Otherwise, it would be ideal. A rocket launcher has no breach, no problem of emplacement. All that's needed is a simple tube to guide the projectile and a light frame. A bazooka is among the best known of our rocket weapons, but there are others, even more powerful, that make every soldier a walking cannon. He can carry such heavy artillery because there's no mechanical recoil. What is mechanical recoil? This action of the gun barrel is caused by the explosion of the propelling charge inside the gun. In the case of a rocket, the blast of the propelling charge is released back into the air. How really accurate is a gun? Well, that depends on the gun crew and the observer. Take a long Tom. A good gun crew, checked and guided by an observer, should be able, after the third round, to hit a Jap pillbox. Or this government building in Manila, used as a stronghold by the Japs. If our guns are that good, then I don't see why we have to use up so much ammunition and why we have to make so much. Well, there are a lot of places we have to hit. But the main reason is that one hit on a fortified position usually isn't enough. Let me give you an example. Suppose this is our military target. It takes only three shots to hit it. But it may take 25 rounds of high explosive shells to destroy it and the enemy snipers inside. Then suppose we have 200 of these 105s available to blast a concentration of similar targets in one sector of the front. Each can take care of a dozen targets in an hour. How much ammunition will we use up? I don't know. Quite a bit, I guess. 72,000 rounds. Now you tell me how long it takes to make one 105 shell. I've heard it takes five man hours. 
All right. That would mean 360,000 men and women in all kinds of industries related to shell making must work one hour just to feed these 200 guns for one hour. Look at the map of the Pacific area and try to visualize what is happening on all fronts there every second of the day and night. How many shells did we use up each second in Europe? Before we could cross the Rhine, we had to use up 800 shells every second of every day, week, and month. 800. 800. 800. And that was only on the ground. Each one of these flying forts has a firepower of 10,000 rounds a minute. 100 super forts can fire more rounds per minute than 22,000 men and women can produce in one hour. And we haven't even talked about the bombs. I was wondering when you were going to get around to them. Do you have a question? Certainly. How many bombs can you carry in one of these super forts? Well, that depends on the type of bomb and how far you want to take them. I want to take them to Tokyo. Don't we all? Well, maximum load for a B-29 is 20,000 pounds. That's five blockbusters. What about incendiaries? We're using more and more of the jellied gasoline type. In three raids over Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe, we've dropped almost a million of them. And here's the kind of results we're getting. Each bomb burns at 3,000 degrees, shooting flames as far as 25 yards. Did we bomb Tokyo with them? Certainly. We've already destroyed an area in Tokyo that's larger than the island of Manhattan. And that's just the beginning. Is this an incendiary? No, this is a smoke bomb dropped by a Pathfinder plane to mark the target. Its bright trail of red or yellow smoke guides the bombers and tells them where to drop their bombs. How can the Pathfinder plane find its target if the weather is cloudy? He has special instruments that can see through fog or haze or clouds. Military secret? Yes, but there's no secret about the effectiveness and accuracy of our bombing. We have countless types of delayed action bombs for low-level attacks. Time so that our planes can get away before the bombs explode. We have general purpose, fragmentation, anti-personnel, armor piercing, depth, and many more secret kinds built to blast and kill. Look at the bridges and docks and arsenals and factories and other targets that we have destroyed. Much of this has been the result of pinpoint bombings. We've sunk hundreds of enemy ships and damaged many more. Even a near miss will often sink a ship by splitting the seams of the hull. With the tremendous fleets of bombers that are now at our command, we can blanket a town with a pattern of bombs that is steadily becoming tighter and more destructive. While we used to drop on the German cities in months, we are now dropping on Japan in weeks. And once the all-out attack is underway, we'll be able to step up that figure to days if we have enough bombs on hand. 22,000 tons on Berlin up to March 1945. 14,000 tons on Munich. 26,000 tons on Vienna. 13,000 tons on Cologne. 35,000 tons have so far been dropped on the islands of Japan. How many more will it take before we get to Tokyo? What will it cost us to get there? I could tell you that it'll cost us billions of dollars and millions of shells and bombs. But it wouldn't answer your question. Not really. There's only one real cost of war, and that's human lives. It cost us 1,214 dead to retake Guam. It cost us 2,359 dead to drive the Japs out of Saipan cost us 4,189 men to occupy Iwo Jima and plant our flag on Mount Suribachi. Now you guess what it'll cost us to get to Tokyo. I can't guess. I don't want to guess. None of us wants to. We don't want to look at these men and count them. For these, Why do you show us all this? What can we do about it? Yes, what can we do about it? We can't bring them back to life. 
No, you can't bring them back to life. Not in any of the places they've fallen. And you can't keep us from fighting and advancing, because that's what we have to do. We can do it on K-rations, but we can't do it on ration bombs and shells. Keep feeding us the ammunition. Give us the powder and the shell cases and the loaded shells and the bombs because every bullet and shell and bomb you make will help to shorten the war. American workers, pass the ammunition and we'll pass it on to the enemy. We'll pass it on through our special delivery service until the last customer has received his share. The more we get, the more they'll get. The quicker that's done, the more of us will come home again. Yes, home again. Hey there, Joe. Pass the ammunition.